talk about the holidays. And uh, later in November, we're also going to have a session about working memory and the TUI learner. So we hope you can join us for some of those events as well and RSVP on our website. And just so you know, REAL provides additional services. We have a Google group where parents um, ask questions and uh, support each other and share resources for TUI students. Um, you can get all the information we've mentioned here on our website. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and all of our previous sessions are available to watch on YouTube. And just so all of you know, we also offer educator professional development workshops. If you would like Real to come speak at your school, uh, please share us uh, with your principal, your teacher, um, or your district, um, and we'd be happy to speak on a wide variety of topics related to 2E. So tonight we are very excited um, to have three amazing speakers here to talk about social skills and 2E students. Um, we are going to have them each uh, do a, about a 10 minute presentation and after which we will take Q&A from the audience. If during the presentations you think of questions, feel free to add them in the chat and we will get to them when all the speakers have uh, talking. So first we are going to have Tony Ratzberg speak. Tony is a marriage and family therapist specializing in gifted and to each children and families. She is the founder of Beacon Wellness Team, a therapy group that provides specialized counseling and therapy for gifted and 2E individuals. She created a unique training program to coach the next generation of mental health professionals in truly understanding the needs of our gifted and 2E community. Tony has worked at private and public schools for many years and now provides training and coaching for SEL programs to schools in the Bay Area. She is the parent of two gifted elementary age children, one, two, E. Take it away, Tony. Thank you, everyone. Um, I need to share my screen, so give me just one moment to get that going. Okay, can everyone see it okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So thank you so much. Um, I heard the word excited a couple of times, and I am. I'm so excited to be here tonight, and just like others are. Um, this is really exciting to see so many people interested in this topic, and as I was going through and planning it, it was amazing how many natural everyday things made me think, I want to include that, or, oh, that makes me think about this. And so it's it's a timely conversation that we're having tonight. And as a parent of two elementary school kids, I can tell you, I know there's amazing influence we can have at this time, but it's also completely overwhelming in others. Um, for example, if you were to Google, like, how do we help social skills? How do we help support our kids? You start getting image after image and blog after blog, and it can just be like, what do I even do? And then you add in the twice exceptionality of our children and it can be overwhelming. Um, we know that they're searching for so much and they're trying so hard. And so, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little feedback. There we go. Um, but one of the things that comes up too is that as we talk about these social experiences, our own experiences come into it. Every conversation I've had with an adult about social skills, it's like, I want them to have what I have, or I want them to avoid what I went through. And so it's hard on parents. And I just want to take a moment to recognize that. And as I was creating what I wanted to share with you tonight, I thought of what, what would a parent want to hear, right? So not just what are skills to teach them, but just kind of a game plan. Where do we go from here? And so talking about what your role is as in a parent of an el el excuse me, elementary child, it's really to ensure that they feel respected in your family and that their inherent worth as a human is valued. Like that's game one, num or number one. And then after that, how do you respectfully help coach them? And how do you teach them skills? And remember that they are still children and they're learning to regulate through your guidance and practicing overcoming challenges with you providing safety. So there are six sections here I'm gonna jump into tonight that can help you in, in doing that. So the first is leaning into your child, really honoring who they are and what they want in life. And I recommend that you get so familiar with your child, know their likes, know their dislikes, what are their skills, what are their challenges, what are their diagnoses and what is giftedness? Try to get dive deep, get to know them and spend as much time as you can talking with them and creating an environment at home that's safe. Our society doesn't talk about challenges. We like to hide it. 
But what we do know is when we don't talk about it, it leads to questions, it leads to anxiety or kind of this restless feeling of well, what's going on. And our two week kiddos, they can feel really uncomfortable. They can pre have anxiety come up because they feel misunderstood. If we talk to them, not only about what they're going through, but what maybe others are going through, it can calm it down and it can really be reassuring for them. So as you're leaning into your child, you also lean into your family. Talk about everybody, talk with everyone. Be, you know, obviously you wanna be respectful of you know, privacy between the siblings and things like that. But if you have a child who stems, the sibling may really benefit from understanding what's going on and how that's help helping their sibling. Or if one of your child has slow processing speed, they might really benefit from saying, hey, you know, this is what this impacts your conversations like. And then they're armed with knowledge and they're curious and they're very compassionate. If we model acceptance, they get to be children and be loving and supportive. And so that's something you can do leaning in. Um, related to this is to really get to know your child is to give them the why behind something. If you want them to share with you, if you want them to do an experience, not only talking about that experience, but talk about why that's important. And this is also a good tip for like homework or rule following, healthy behavior, things like that. Give them the why. Why does this matter? And then find out what their perspective is on it. Because if you're encouraging them to go do something new and they go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I should do it. But I'm nervous about it. Your response as a parent is completely different than if they come to you and say, nope, I don't share that value with you, mom. And so if you get to know them, you know how to have those conversations. You know what you can do. And then creating safe spaces. This might seem kind of obvious, but it's so easy to rush our kids into a situation. And so when you're thinking about what are you doing for them, if you want them to take a risk, make it safe. You can think about a time you were doing something new or you were asked to do something, you're feeling uncomfortable about it. If you imagine, you know, having good rest, you're feeling healthy, you're feeling calm, you're going to present in one way. If you're nervous, if you're lack of sleep, or maybe you're not feeling sick, it's going to go a different way. So think about that with your children is you want to set them up for success, help them feel safe, have that solid foundation, so they don't have to worry about those things. This might be having a safe person, might be having sensory tools like noise canceling headphones. Um, it might be as simple as making sure they have a hoodie or they know when to take that hoodie off. But just thinking about that with the, that lens can make a space really safe. Um, when you're trying new things and putting them into new spaces, think about going small. You don't have to take a leap. If they're anxious in social situations, don't jump to a week long sleep away camp thinking, hey, this is gonna be great. They're gonna overcome it all. <laughs> They'll probably shut down and they're not gonna go. So do a small step. If they're mostly playing online, can they take one of those people they're playing online and pull it into the same room and play next to them? And I feel like I could talk about this topic forever here, but how to help them with coping with emotions is so important across the board for development, but really for social development too. Understanding emotions and coping with them can help them regulate. And if you're putting them into a social situation that causes anxiety or if they have social anxiety, they're going to be in fight, fight, or freeze a lot. And you want them to know, hey, I can regulate. I know what to do with these feelings. I know what could help me. So be proactive with the talking about it. Help them pre-plan. If they're going somewhere new, what does that look like? What do they need? What do they do if something doesn't go well or if they need a break? Give, kind of arm them with a plan that can help reduce the anxiety. Then encourage them to use the tools and you use tools too, because if you can model using your coping school, skills, not only do you feel better, but also you can help them co-regulate. So I wanna take a moment and just share a tool with you that I love. And it's from Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. It's called Welcoming Hands. And what it is, it's a body first approach. And so often we talk about with our kids, Think about your thoughts, think about your feelings, that's going to calm your body, that's going to settle it. But really, we can move our body and we can start to see a shift. It doesn't solve a problem, but it can take the edge off. So welcoming hands just means that you take your forearms and your palms and you put them upward. And, you know, of course, you can do it like this. I'm doing it so you can see it on the screen, but you can also do it on your lap. You can do it on the top of a table, but you just switch it so your forearms and your palms are up. If I was standing up right now, I would just turn it so they're facing forward away from my body. Leave your arms in that position for 
30 seconds, couple minutes, and you'll notice that the anxiety starts to subside. And this is because our forearms are a very sensitive and vulnerable spot of our body. So when we expose it, we're sending the brain a message that says, hey, it's all safe. I wouldn't be exposing this if it wasn't okay. So it starts to reset and kind of contradict some of the thoughts and the feelings. And then maybe if they're calm a little bit, you can impose some other coping skills and ideas and say, hey, how about we try this? How about we try that? Coaching children instead of doing. I almost put on this slide, like, don't do it for them. Because if you can coach children, they're going to learn more and they're going to learn calm or build confidence. And so coaching involves a lot of different things. Model for them. Let them see you struggle. Let them see you succeed. If they see you being social, they're going to learn. How did my parent do that? They're going to observe it. They're going to pick up on what you do. Also talk with them. Talk as much as you can. And actually, I'm going to take that back. Don't talk. Have a conversation with them so that you're not just sharing what you're saying, but you're hearing what they have to say. If you talk about their life, if you talk about a character they're interested in a book or a movie, you start to learn not only about them, but they're starting to learn and hear about social experiences too. Um, if you have a Harry Potter fan on your hands, endless opportunities to talk about social experiences and how they're emotionally feeling about them. And an easy conversation starter is, hey, I noticed and I wonder. So for example, you could say, I noticed you were sitting alone today. I wonder how you're feeling about that. And they may answer, they may shrug and say nothing, depending on the age and kind of their mood. But if you're noticing open-ended questions don't work, you could say, I noticed you were sitting alone today. I wonder if you were lonely. And then they might tell you, no, you're wrong. That's not what I was feeling. Or yeah, I was. Or they're going to stay quiet and they're going to think about it. Any of those options are good because you've got them thinking, you've got them processing about it and kind of figuring out what does that feel like for me? And then also in coaching, you can role play and you can give them options. So a good example of options is imagine you're at a family event. There's going to be a lot of pressure, especially if there's grandparents there to say goodbye. And what does that goodbye look like? So give them options. Let them know they can give a hug, a high five. They can say goodbye or they could wave. And then you let them choose it and you help advocate and let the other adults be okay with that. So this will encourage them to connect, but it doesn't force them to do something they don't like or they don't want to do. If in a case like that, you've given options and you see your child struggling, you can give them an out. Something like, hey, looks like right now you're not up for saying goodbye and that's okay, let's go. You're their advocate, you can help them, and then you can process that later. Okay. Elementary school, we get, as parents, we get to plan and we get to supervise and have our hands in so many different social experiences. So you can think about a lot of different things, but step one, the best resource is your child. Ask them what ideas they have or what interests they're willing to try. And then you can start to think about other things. Who are people that they're interested in? Who do they like to be around? Who might be people that would be kind of a stretch, like they don't really love being around them, but it could be a good learning experience, although make sure they're still safe with that. And then where are the places? Are there conferences, clubs, museums? Where are those people that they would be interested in? Where are they? And then pull in their interests. What, how can you make their interests social? What can you do to build upon that? So a good example is if they love competitive puzzle building and say that's online and they're doing puzzles all day, start teaching them chess and then slowly move that into maybe you guys are playing, it's not online, and then move that into an in-person group. So you've taken something that they've loved that stimulated their brain in a certain way and you've built upon it instead of pulling something random in. You can also look at day-to-day -day activities. At a restaurant, have them you know, say hello to the waiter order their own food, talk in families. You know, if you sit down and have dinner, how are they engaging there? How are they sharing? If they're at a store, especially a store with something that they really like, they can ask questions. They can talk to the people there. And school is a tricky opportunity because really there's always going to be some component of socializing and advocacy that take place there. And that can be great for some people. They might want to start a club. They might want to be part of a play or an activity. And others might say, oh, hold on, I'm here for school. Don't bring the social stuff into it. So you've got to look at that and say, what works for your child? Where can you meet them? And how do you make that work for school? 
Um, you might have to advocate for your child. You might have to encourage, you know, different things because every school has a different philosophy and you have to find what works right for your kid. Online, it's a controversial topic, I know, because screen time is hard to manage, but really it's a great place for them to engage and to connect. And especially with our twice exceptional kids, they can find people who share those really specific interests. So find a way that maybe you can be comfortable with it and you can feel that they're safe. Okay, and I think this is just as important as preparing before a social activity is to recover from it. Make a plan with your child. What are you gonna do? If you've asked them, hey, I want you to go to this activity and I want you to try it. What does that look like after? Are they gonna need some food? Do they need just quiet time? Do they need to sit with you? What does it look like? How can they help themselves? And then after, when they're feeling better, take a few minutes and open up a conversation. What did they like about their activity? What did they not like about it? Would they want to meet anybody again? You just kind of start asking some questions. And if you get nowhere, that's okay, because you're opening the door to conversation. And the more you open it, the more likely they are to walk through that door and talk with you at different times. So keep trying it, even if it feels like, hey, they don't want to talk to me right now. But that said, in the moment, if we're feeling anxious about one of our child's needs, we can totally run the risk of over talking or just like staying there too much. And once we do that, if they're flooded, they're gonna tune us out and nothing we can share or connect with them about the social experience is gonna stick. So read their cues and feel free to move on. If you know, let say that activity is done and move on to the next thing. And just a few final thoughts I wanted to share with you. One is I would be very remiss if I didn't mention the impact of the pandemic. So to put that in perspective is a child who was in fourth grade when everything shut down, they likely came back to the social world in middle school. That's a huge leap. And that's without having all those years of in the world experience. And now they're just expected to be a middle schooler. So even though our children are resilient, we also want to remember this is a big deal. And none of us personally have been through it before, and we've never been through it as children. So being gentle with them and having patience is really important. Also, keep them talking. Encourage them to spend time with you. When they're younger, they want to play games. They want to share it. Take that time to do it. Take them on a walk or go have a conversation over a meal. And that keeps the door open as they get older. And letting, I, I mentioned this before, but letting them hear you, letting them witness and hear, hear what you go through and what your, your experiences are. And then please remember to be flexible with yourself. If you're honoring your child, they're gonna change. And at some point you're gonna need to pivot or something unexpected is gonna happen. So if you collaborate with them, you're gonna honor their individuality, but you're probably gonna go out of your comfort zone at some time and it's okay to ask for help. If you can build a community around you, you'll have places to check in and say, hey, this is happening. You know, what do you think I should do? What could help my child? Um, what, where can I go for support here? And that's a big risk. It's hard to ask a parent for a play date when we don't know how that's gonna go. It's hard to go to a play date and watch our child maybe sit there by themselves. You're constantly doing it. So if you have a community around you, it makes it a little bit easier. And then the most important thing here at the end, I just want to share is keep believing in yourself and honoring you and your child. If you lean into each other, you're going to have more success and social experiences and your relationship together. So thank you for being here tonight and listening to these tips and excited to hear the next few presenters. Thank you so much, Tony. I took pages of notes already. Um, ready to use it with my elementary schooler. So thank you so much. Um, and if people have questions for Tony, you can start to put them in the chat and we will ask them um, after all the speakers have finished. So next we have um, Dr. Hadley McGregor. She's a postdoctoral fellow in the Child and Adult Neurodevelopmental Clinic and the Program for Education and Enrichment of Relational Skills or PEERS Clinic at UCLA Semmel Institute for Neuroscience. That is a mouthful. She has been working with neuroscience individual, neurodiverse individuals across the lifespan for 10 years. And her expertise revolves around researching and providing evidence-based treatments for neurodiverse individuals from culturally diverse backgrounds who have co-occurring tic disorders, anxiety, and obsessive compulsive disorder. Welcome Dr. McGregor. And we'll let you share your slides when you're ready. 
Wonderful. All right. I know it is a, it is definitely a mouthful. That's why I, I honestly have to Google the phrase peers, even <laughs> like, even though I've been a part of peers for years on what it stands for. Cause I just say peers. Cause I, I can't even think of saying the entire thing. Um, but Thanks everyone for having me today. I'm really excited to get a chance to just talk to you a lot about just kind of, I mean, really, I just first want to say I'm I'm going to echo a lot of what Tony just said. Um, so a lot of what she was talking about for our younger kiddos, right? About just kind of checking in, making sure that you're following their lead, supporting, coaching, things like that. You're going to still want to do when they get older as well. I mean, obviously, in terms of how you're interacting, it'll feel a little bit different. And I'll, I'll talk about just kind of some specific changes and even just language that we're using differently. But in terms of just the compassion, that should always be there, that kind of meeting them where they are, especially when it comes to social skills, which are hard for pretty much everyone in some capacity. And so I think just being really gentle with that is important. Um, so today I, I am going to be talking about peers specifically, but also things that you can be doing at home because I recognize that not everybody has the ability to do a 16 week intervention or even the access to that intervention. And so a lot of the things that we do in peers are, well, everything we do in peers is, is considered ecologically valid, which are things that you can just do in your everyday life. And most people may be already doing, but a lot of our two e kiddos or teens or young adults may be missing those things. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that today. Um, before I get started, just in kind of even talking about peers or even um, some of the skills or, or things like that, I, I really, really, really want to emphasize that it's super important to us and peers and, and just me personally, that when it comes to social skills, we're not encouraging our kids or our teens or our young adults to mask and be somebody that they're not or pretend to be somebody that they're not or, or even force social skills on them. In terms of peers specifically, we actually don't take anybody who isn't explicitly interested in learning these skills. So if a parent says, I want my child to have these skills, but the teen says, I'm not interested, we'll say, you know, come back when they are, because we don't believe in forcing that on somebody who's not interested, right? And you may think, but that parent is trying to set them up for success and, and they're interested and they, they, they want to learn those skills to support their kids, which is great. And also there are programs that can help support parents as well. We wanna make sure that we're really following the lead of our teens and our young adults um, when it comes to social skills so that these things are fun and enjoyable because, and something I, I say to my teens every time we start a 16 week intervention, right? Is that I know it's gonna feel like we're asking you to put a lawn on your plate, but everything that we do here should feel fun. And if it doesn't have a conversation with us because then this may not be a good fit, right? Being able to have get togethers with your friends or meet new people and things like that. If those are your social goals, we can help support you with those. But if they're not, we don't wanna force those on you either. So please just be mindful of that, I think, really following your your teen's lead or your young adult's lead when it comes to those things is really important um, because it, they can burn out, right? And they then they don't want to learn these things. And then that's where we see things like depression or anxiety really start to increase when they're feeling forced upon. Um, so just kind of a way of background, just to like you know, kind of what peers is and to let you know where I'm coming from. Um, so peers or the program for education and Enrichment of Relational Skills, or PEERS, was developed at UCLA by Dr. Elizabeth Logason in 2004, and it's now used in over 150 countries. Um, so it has been translated into over a dozen languages, and it's one of the only evidence-based skill, social skills group um, for individuals who have social difficulties, um, which means we've done a ton of research on these. Specifically, we work a lot with um, autistic individuals. Um, however, it's really for anyone who is struggling with social difficulties. So I see teens who have ADHD, who have learning disabilities, who um, are have depression, who are anxiety, like have anxiety. So it really, I think, just depends if if social skills is your goal, then this is a good place for you. Um, it is parent or caregiver assisted, which is super important. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a, in a moment, but we really emphasize this culture of errorless learning where we're supporting our, our 
teens or we're supporting our young adults, making sure that they feel like they're in a space that's safe and comfortable where they can practice these skills and not feel like, oh no, I've done something wrong or, oh no, I've made it a mistake, right? Everything is really, we like to just say errorless learning, right? We're all learning from each other and including me as the group leader, I'm constantly learning from the people that I work with. Um, and as I mentioned, we teach ecologically valid skills, which is really important for our teens because we don't want them to go into the world with things that would work in a movie or, or in theory, right? But really things that genuinely work. And so one example I, I really like to give is we talk about um, just kind of even on the first day, like, what do you do if you want to meet somebody? Like, what what advice have people given you? And a lot of our teens will say, oh, just go up and say hi, right? And I think many of us can think of an instance in which somebody came up to us and just said hi and stood there, and then we didn't know what to do. And we felt uncomfortable. And so I would never put my teen in that situation where they're now making somebody feel uncomfortable because of advice that I've given them. And so instead, right, we're picking up on different aspects of, of just social nuances of, okay, what is like this person wearing or doing or um, reading or where are they, right? What can you pick up on to drop a comment? Like, hey, I noticed you have a skateboard or I noticed you're reading this this anime I really like, or I, I noticed that you were at the beach yesterday and, and picking up on those things that you can have a conversation on versus just saying, hi, my name is Hadley, because that's really hard to build a conversation off of. So we do all ecologically valid skills or things that we've seen work. Um, obviously nothing works for everybody a hundred percent of the time, but we've seen it work for lots of teens and lots of young adults. Um, so in terms of just some of the skills that we do, just to kind of give you an idea of what we really cover, we we start with everybody foundationally. So this is really important um, that we are in a place of just, again, it's errorless learning. We're all learning this together. Some of the teens will say like, I already know how to do a conversation, right? But great, then let's support the other people in the group that are still working on these things so that when we get to your skill, maybe they can help support you too, right? So we start with just the, the foundations of conversation skills, how to start a conversation and enter it, how to exit it, which I think we can all agree is very awkward at most times. Um, electronic communication, right? How do we find that source of friends? What does that look like? What are we, what am I even looking for in friends? What do I even, what do I even care about? I mean, I can think of even today, I was working with one of my teens and was like, well, what are your interests? I had no idea, right? And so those are the conversations that you're going to have with your teen so that they know, oh, I'm interested in Roblox. I love that. I want somebody who also is interested in Roblox. But if they can't identify kind of their own interests, it's going to be a lot harder for them to just kind of go out and find people that like the same things that they do. So that's where parents and caregivers come in. Appropriate use of humor, which I think we can all kind of agree there's been moments where we've probably heard somebody make a joke and it fell flat and it's awkward after. And, and that can happen with our teens and our young adults too. And so giving them kind of that humor feedback of like, when is it appropriate to tell jokes? Like, what is an appropriate joke? When is humor good to use and, and maybe not so great to use? Um, good sportsmanship, which is really especially helpful for our, our younger teens who are still having a hard time kind of even wanting to play games that they don't necessarily love 100%, right? If my teen really loves to play Roblox and then turns out that their friend really just wants to play Minecraft, what does that look like? How do you support your teen and, and saying, you know, let's, let's do what your friend wants to do for right now, make a compromise and, and be a good sport about that get togethers, which are really just kind of the crux of deepening those friendships and conflict, conflict resolution, which is honestly probably my favorite skill and something that I think every single person can use um, just in terms of how to bring up a disagreement, how to respond to a disagreement, how to stay calm in that moment without feeling like I'm, I don't know where to go next, right? And then um, things like changing your reputation if you need to, and then handling bullying, which encompasses teasing, it encompasses cyberbullying and physical bullying, as well as rumors and gossip, which are all really relevant, especially in those middle school and high school years. Um, so in terms of just kind of like how we teach it, right? So that's that's the content. But 
it's really not what we teach. It's really how we teach it. So this is kind of the formula that we like to use. We use small group format. And this is important because if you can imagine like 50 people in a room, someone's going to get lost. They're going to kind of get lost in the shuffle. And so we really like to keep it closer to maybe 10, maybe 11 kiddos. Um, I would say probably a dozen max. Um, and that's just so that they can have time to practice the skills in vivo. They can get a chance to, to learn from their peers, get to meet other peers that have similar interests as they do, maybe similar struggles as they do. Um, a lot of the social skills groups are that are aside from peers are, are what we call kind of like drop-off groups where you kind of just drop in and it's like, okay, what do you want to talk about today? Like what's kind of on your mind, which is really great for processing, but in terms of like learning skills is really challenging, right? And so that means that maybe somebody gets lost in, in terms of, well, I, I, I don't really understand that advice or they're getting bad advice from their teen peers because that's not really how things work, et cetera. And so we really like to have very concrete tips that we always say are optional for our teens. If they want to use them, they can. If they want to save them for later, they can. If they want to teach a friend about them, they can, right? Because we've seen these things be successful. Um, we also use uh, the Socratic method, which I really encourage parents to use at home as well. It's asking questions in a very certain way to elicit a response, right? the why questions, the what questions, right? So one thing that we do is we will play these role play videos and we'll ask like, what did she do there, right? We're not labeling the behavior. We're very much putting it on the teens to say, what did they just observe, right? Oh, she she yelled at that person or, oh, she she just walked in and interrupted. And, and, and then we'll say, and what was that like for the group, right? What is that like for them? And again, we're not labeling anything they are right? Oh, uncomfortable or awkward. And a lot of times these are things that I'll get like chats when we do it through telehealth and teens will say, oh, I do this or, oh man, I've done that before. And they're, they're now seeing it for the first time of how would that even impact somebody else, right? If their goal is to make and keep friends and they see people now feeling awkward, well, they don't want people to feel awkward around them. And so just having those questions, eliciting kind of those perspective taking questions from them is really, really helpful. And that's where that parent assistant really comes in. It's, it's so important to have not only just that modeling where you're, you're kind of doing the steps yourself or going through them yourself, but also coaching them through, right? Like, Oh, like, why don't we try it like this? Or um, let's make it so it's like this, right? So it's, it's more you or using language that feels more comfortable for them, et cetera. And then we get it we practice, we, we practice together. And so then they get feedback, positive feedback from their peers, from their coaches in, in vivo, which is really important that they get a chance to practice those things. Um, in terms of, and I, I mentioned this, right? So as far as what we actually teach, it's not, um, it's not a modular program. So it's not kind of like pick and choose. It's, it's really stepwise. And I, I mentioned, we start kind of with those foundational skills. And it's really important because if you think about it, right, when kids are younger, how do they interact? How do they get to know each other through play? But when they get older, right, a lot of that, those play things, that's not really happening in middle school or in high school necessarily for a lot of our, um, a lot of our teens and our young adults, right? It's more kind of now they're talking more, they're communicating more, and the demands change, they're different. And so this is where we want to really kind of focus on finding hobbies where they can meet other people to have those conversations versus setting up play dates, which I'll, I'll talk about just a little bit more. And then having just that support from home is really important. Um, these are, I love this. And if you want to like take a screenshot of this, like go ahead, sure. Or I, I guess this is recorded, but I really, really love this. Um, so we really encourage not only like our, our providers to use this when we're in groups, but our, our um, parents as well to use what we call the four P's. So you're priming. So before you send your kid into the world and say like, hey, do these social skills, right? You're going over a practice with them. Okay, what steps do we want to follow? We call this like kind of a cognitive rehearsal of just kind of mentally going over some of those steps, right? There's prompting using buzzwords like, um, like a, for instance, I guess like a peer's buzzword would be, we call like a cover story 
the reason why we, we are talking to somebody in the first place, right? Like, so what is your cover story for why you're calling somebody? Have that kind of already set up so that you're not like, hello, and then at a loss for, oh no, why did I call, right? Have them going over those steps, have them kind of creating that backstory already and, and just setting them up for success and then praising, which is my favorite P, giving so much praise for any attempts or any just effort at all, right? This this isn't easy for, for most people. And so really praising that and then using that corrective feedback in a praise sandwich, right? That was really great. I love how you did this. What if we did this like small thing a little different next time, but this looked really great, right? Like really just couching it in praise. So it feels good. It feels comfortable and it feels like something they're want to going to want to continue to do. Okay. So in terms of that's kind of, again, the background of how we, we do peers, um, the program and, and some of the, um, just supports that we have in place. But in terms of just some skills that you you all can do right now at home, right? So here are some things that you can practice. Help your teen or young adult or, or kids, right? I'm, I'm gonna just kind of use these words broadly, but find common interests, right? What do you like? What is your interest? What do you, what do you like to do? Encourage them. And if they, they don't really have anything, help them find that, right? Try different things with them and not in a painful way where it's like you're enrolling them in a bunch of things and they get burnt out, but just again, letting them kind of experiment and try things out and see what feels fun, because that's, what's going to give them that kind of foundation to have those conversations with other people, right? Like I have so many teens that could talk about anime for hours on end, hours on end with anybody who will listen about it, right? And and if they are asked like, oh, what are their what are your interests? Right? Anime. Where do we find other friends that have anime interests? Right. And that's where you can kind of support them. Have them ask other people questions. A lot of times our, our teens get really excited to talk about the things they want to talk about. And so sometimes it's a, it's important for us to remind them to ask other people questions. And I like to always ask, right, why do we want to ask somebody else questions? How will I get to know them if, if I never ask any questions, right? If I talk the entire time, who do I get to know? And the teens will say yourself, right? You, you only know about you now because you never asked anything. Um, but there's those moments too, where maybe we're talking with somebody else who also has a hard time asking questions. And so answer your own question. If I said, what are you going to do on the weekend? And the person said, go hiking and never asked me anything back. Right. Then I can say, oh, that's really fun. I'm going to do this. So encourage them to kind of have that ping pong back and forth. What does that look like? And share the conversation. And some of that also looks like using open-ended questions, right? We're not going to be kind of what we call like an interviewer where you're asking a bunch of yes or no questions, but rather things like, what kinds of things do you like? What kinds of things do you do on the weekend? Um, and then asking those follow-up questions to get more information. This is really, I really like this also. Um, this is how to kind of plan a get together. And so when we're in childhood, preschool, even elementary school, right? Parents plan these. Parents plan our play dates. But when we get to middle school, parents aren't really planning as much, right? They're supporting for sure, but right, it's not happening as much. And by high school, it's really not happening at all, right? And and that's uh, of course there's exceptions and and for individuals that need support for sure. But I think largely speaking, right, we move from this idea of play dates to our teens and our young adults trying to organize these things on their own, which is hard. And so having this kind of nicely laid out, like just right before you decide you want to spend time with somebody thinking about who do you want to be there? Who's going to be invited? And should I invite somebody else in the middle of it? No, right? I want to make sure that whoever's going to be invited knows who's going to be there, kind of planning that ahead of time. What are we going to do? In the beginning, we really want to make sure, especially we're doing activity-based get-togethers because that's where they can just learn from each other, but also not just stare at each other and I don't know what to say next, right? You have something to kind of occupy your time. The when, when is it going to happen? Saying something like, we should hang out sometime. That may never happen. So concretely having a plan of like when it will happen, where will it be? 
letting them know, is it going to be at my house, your house, et cetera? And how is it going to happen? Do I need tickets? Do I need a ride, et cetera? So using these five W's to really plan, okay, how am I going to have my get together? And then during my get together, right? I mentioned activity-based, having it be something that's already kind of in place so that when conversation inevitably with anybody dies down, it's not that awkward because you're doing something already. We want to make sure that our guests pick it. If we've invited somebody to our house, we want them to feel like they're comfortable. They had a say in what we're going to do, right? And remembering that friendship is a choice. And if my friend keeps picking the wrong thing or, or a not fun game, then I don't have to see them again, or I don't have to keep hanging out with them again, right? Just really following your, your child's lead on that and going with the flow in the moment on, and things kind of feel tough. And then finally keeping it short. I think a lot of times when people have like first get togethers, they think, man, I have to plan this really grand day, but really you might want to just keep it to an hour or even like an hour and a half or, or even less because you're going to run out of conversation things. And so setting our teens up for success with that, it's important. So just to, some tips, uh, right? So having social coaches or, or parents or caregivers following up with things like who picked the activities, right? Did you trade information? So did you have conversation? How much of the time did you do that? Again, getting them to think about, oh, what did I do during this? What were some of the common interests? What could you do with those common interests if you were going to hang out, et cetera, right? Did you have a good time? That's a huge, important question. And is this somebody that you might want to see again? This helps parents know, is this somebody I want to schedule again with? This is a really important one too, right? When it comes to, I think the internet, it's it's super important because a lot of our teens and young adults, especially are finding friends online more, more than ever. And I think um, something, and I, I appreciated Tony saying this too for our little kiddos as well, is that remember that they started a lot of their formative social years happened during a pandemic where, where are they meeting people, right? Also, where do you meet people in general? If you have such a niche, interest. And so the important, the number one importance is always going to be safety, but we also want to follow our teen's lead of like, where can I help my teen or my young adult find something that's not only safe, but is going to allow them to have that social outlet. Also checking in with them on, is this a fulfilling friendship to you? Right? I think I think a lot of us come from a time where online friendships don't feel fulfilling or, oh, that, that must not feel like a real friendship, but that's not how things are anymore. And so not assuming that it's not a real friendship or it doesn't feel comfortable or it, it, it's not what they want or they're lonely unless they're saying these things. And so that's where that open dialogue and, and just discourse is really important to have with your young adult and your teen. Um, and we do, I mean, I you see that little line where it says, Parents should monitor unobtrusively and, and we agree, right? Mm -hmm. Safety is the most important thing. So just kind of some, some final thoughts is that friendship is a choice. And I think reminding our teens that because sometimes it can feel like just that the world is against us and that it feels like, why does everybody get to be friends but me? And, and I think just remembering that that they get to choose friends that may not choose them, but that friends may choose them and they don't want to choose them back. And so putting that autonomy back in their hands, um, having those open conversations with what they want in terms of friendships and really just being flexible yourself and what you want for your teen or young adults friendships, right? What does that look like? And, and how can you best support them by just practicing at home? Thank you. And, and I'm happy to answer any questions um, in the chat as well. Thank you so much, Hadley. That was wonderful. And it's perfect because I have an elementary and a secondary age. So now I have notes for both of them. And I especially love asking them what they want from a friendship. I think that's so important um, because when they're older, they really want to um, And last but not least, um, we'll have um, Doug Ronning, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist and a registered drama therapist and board certified trainer with the North American Drama Therapy Association. He has a neurodiversity affirmative clinical practice in Walnut Creek, where he integrates HRV biofeedback, talk therapy, expressive arts, gaming, and drama therapy. He also facilitates role play game groups that focus on social emotional interaction through Gamescape Center for Creativity and Growth. In addition, Doug is an assistant professor and core faculty in the drama therapy program 
at the, Univers at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco. I'm excited to hear about games and social skills, Doug. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Um, okay. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, two-way social engagement through role taking and role playing. Um, and I want to start with some considerations that may affect a youth's desire for social interaction. Um, attachment. Um, particularly when we're talking about neurodivergent folks, when we're talking about attachment, we're not just talking about social attachment. We're talking about those attachment, like we were talking earlier about anime. Um, kids attach to things that they have passions about. Um, and they have different attachment needs and different attachment styles. And the attachment needs and attachment styles may affect their desire for social interaction. Agency. Is this something I want? Is this something that I'm interested in? Uh, does it match my values? Um, when I'm working with kids, I often center values. Um, I start with values. I'll often start with a values card sort uh, in the very beginning. Um, and imagination, uh, foresight. Can I imagine having fun and being friends with this person? Um, one of, uh, when we had our planning meeting for this group, um, we saw some of the questions that were coming up and I saw um, uh, some of the questions started with, how can I get my kid to, and rather than ask, how can I get my kid to, I want, to cons I want you to consider, what does my kid want, and then invite them to engage socially through this uh, engagement, using their agency and imagination. And this is why I love games and gameplay, because games are agency laboratories. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about transactional analysis. This is a form of therapy that I have some really uh, complicated feelings about, but I really do love how they talk about social interaction um, and social needs. So you'll see that uh, the way that, um, Dr. Byrne, who created this model back in the 1970s, uh, groups all human activities and interactions to what he calls transactions. And there are different kinds of transactions. Um, and we structure our time around these transactions. Um, and each of these transactions has a different level of interpersonal recognition, what he calls strokes. So with withdrawal, that first one, all of these are valuable. None of these are more valuable than the other. Um, but I know for parents, often they will want their kids to, to get to some of the, the activities and even to the intimacy where they're being able to express their authentic selves. Um, but when I'm doing game groups, I am really permissive and inviting. So I will, if, if a kid is having a, a, a rough week, uh, I ain't I'm glad that they're there and they may withdraw that week and then really show up in a strong way the following week. So recognizing that um, withdrawal is a normal and, and a valuable part of human experience. You'll notice as we go through these, um, I'm going to close this window because I can't see my own slide because the, the faces are imploding in front of it. Um, and ex please excuse my eye patch. I had a high eye injury um, and had eye surgery. You know, I'm going to do this. Uh, um, so as you see, um, interpersonal demand increases uh, with each of these, as does the, the amount of strokes or the interpersonal recognition. So with going from withdrawal, we have rituals. These are familiar social interactions like um, uh, having dinner with the family, for example. Uh, pastimes, this is talking with very little action. So for example, chatting with friends or playing uh, 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 Minecraft with a friend uh, online. And then there are activities where this is directing energy towards an outcome. So if they're just exploring uh, and talking while they're playing Minecraft, that may be a pastime. But if they combine their efforts to try to build something, that would become an activity. And this is where 
Um, when I'm talking about games, like tabletop games, role play games, I'm talking about activities because Byrne uses the word games in a negative way. Uh, he talks about games and you'll notice that this is higher than all these ones I've been talking about. This is a series of trans transactions with a, a psychological payoff. I prefer to call these games positionality because in this, um, this is where people are vying for a position, gossip, bullying. Uh, all of these would fall into this category. Notice where this is on this list. It is just below intimacy and higher than activity. And that is because um, the interpersonal recognition, the, 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 those strokes are higher, um, but there's also greater risk. There's al also a greater uh, interpersonal demand. Um, and, and with games, because of the positionality, um, it can be hurtful to others. Um, so I'm always tracking when, when positionality is happening. Um, and then intimacy is being able to express authentic feelings and wants without censoring. And of course, this is ideal. This is what we really want um, from our, our kids in, in both play and in conversation. Um, and so that's what we're really trying to um, uh, uh, have, have kids have an experience of and, and teens have, and all of us have an experience of. With games in particular, there are different reasons that people play games and um, a desire to win is only one of them. And indeed, I think it's the smallest one. This is figure illustrates how, um, how uh, games can be evaluated through the different experience. The game as an experience is the second. Uh, there are so many great games. If you have a kid who loves mathematics, there are so many great games designed by great mathematicians. There's a great game designer by the name of Reiner Knizia, who's a mathematician and designs amazing games that are simple to learn. You can learn them in five or 10 minutes, but really hard to master because of the, all of the permutations that are very valuable. And the third way that games can be used is desire for management of social situation. This is how I use role play games and games in my practice. Um, the games that most people know are the ones that we were introduced in childhood. Candyland, Monopoly, Battleship, Clue. These have very thin roles, but they all have roles. So in Mon Monopoly, everybody's playing a real estate broker. In Battleship, everybody's playing a mi military admiral. And in Clue, everybody's playing a detective. But you don't really get a sense of the role. Uh, there's just the mechanics in the game. I'm going to tell some intervention examples, but I'm not going to give any identifying information. I was working with a 2 kid who loved the game Battleship because of the deductive reasoning that was part of the game, the deductive nature of the game, but was sensitive to the game because uh, they didn't like the idea of, of, of being in battle and hurting people. And so uh, I didn't want that, that to be a limit to be able to play the game. So I came up with a way of changing the role. And I said, what if you and I both are military admirals and we went to military school together and we're best friends. And now we find ourselves on opposite sides of a war, a conflict. And so we're going to play where we are trying to miss each other's ships. And this kid loved this idea. And this changing of the roles changed the scope of the game. Because rather, when, in, when you're playing Battleship uh, uh, regularly, you, hit, you get a hit and you go, yes. And then you're trying to, to find exactly where that ship is. Where when we played, we would get a hit and then try to avoid that area. So even changing the role change the dynamic of the game. Uh, a lot of kids don't like think they like games because they learn those, those games where everybody has the same abilities. These are better family games. So uh, if you are going to buy games for your family, these are games that I want to suggest because they have varying abilities. Every player in the game is going to have a different ability. So already role starts to matter. In Forbidden Island, this is a collaborative game where everybody is trying to gather these four treasures, but the island is sinking underneath. Um, and uh, you need to get all four of the treasures and get off the island before the island sinks completely. And every character in the game has a different ability to help to meet that, uh, that goal. Uh, one of the other games that I love to use is King of Tokyo. Um, King of Tokyo does uh, start in the base edition of the box. I know it sounds like I'm, I'm trying to sell games here, but um, uh, 
in the power up editions, they have different abilities. So if you're going to get King of Tokyo, I, I suggest the monster edition, which has all of the power ups built in, or immediately start to buy the power ups. Because what's cool about King of Tokyo is that the monsters are different and all have different abilities, can have different abilities. I was working with two brothers who had very high conflict, both were 2E. Um, and there was very sh few shared activities that they enjoyed. And I was working with them as, as, as a pair as, as, in family therapy um, and, and found very few activities that they wanted to engage in together, but they both took to this game and they both took to specific characters. I was playing different monsters every week, but they took to these two specific characters. The older brother took to Cyber Bunny. You'll see that Cyber Bunny is the mechanical bunny with a kind of a mastermind in the head. And the uh, other monster is a big somatic uh, with big arms uh, and, and looks like they, uh, they could readily hug even though they look like they have a, a, a mean face. These two monsters matched the, the, the way these kids move through the world, right? Uh, the mastermind and then trying to protect their, their mechanical figure. And then this one kid who's, who's very somatic and energetic and, and, uh, and uh, accident prone. And it was so great to be able to refine these roles. We took them out of the game because they enjoyed to play with, playing with them so much. And we actually created backstories and stories based on these characters and started to make up stories about these, which takes us into role play games. Um, role play games are more storytelling devices than they are games. So there is a game system. There's often no winners in a role play game. Um, and these are really fantastic for two week kids um, and two week teens. And the reason being is it is very easy to fold in their passions and interests. Um, one of my go-to games is a game called City of Mist where every character play, uh, creates a logos, which is their everyday life. When I'm creating the characters with the kids, I will often have them give those their, their characters some of their everyday challenges as well as their everyday strengths but then also there's a mythos for your character and in this game a mythic character connects to you and you get their abilities and some of their intentions in the world so you may be attached to peter pan and uh, i have a lot of kids who use anime characters games uh, characters from their video, favorite video games i did a camp this summer um and uh, for many of the kids, there were 10 teens, neurodivergent teens. Um, about half the kids were 2E, half the kids, uh, the teens uh, were on the autism spectrum. Uh, and while there were clusters that knew each other, none of them uh, knew each other coming in as, 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 a, as a total group. Um, and we were together 10 days, uh, five, uh, 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 five days for 20 hours and went from, uh, an experience of not knowing each other to uh, playing out this epic fantasy game in, li in, in live action over the course of those days. These are some of the valuable things that role play games uh, can facilitate. Uh, role expansion, uh, perspective taking, it encourages insight and foresight, it fosters problem solving, clarifies personal values, processing emotional experiences, practicing forms of social communication. Um, I often will play the non-player characters. And when I know somebody is challenged by something, if for example, if they just don't know how to deal with angry people, I may then create uh, a culture of people who communicate through anger. And so when they get to this village where uh, everybody expresses anger freely, um, we'll have to kind of find ways of being able to communicate with anger. So I will find out what their challenges are and fold them into the game as well as their strengths. Uh, it's a great way of breaking stereotypes, providing opportunities for organizational and reflective thinking. I'm not the only one who does this work. There's also, there's um, great uh, therapists throughout the country who are doing role play games. This is something you can do at home. Uh, most famously, of course, is Dungeons and Dragons. Critical Core has their own version of Dungeons and Dragons that has been designed specifically to work in a therapeutic way. It's called Critical Core. You can buy it directly from their website. It has some pre-made characters um, and it is created with a developmental functioning uh, model in mind. Um, uh, I always start with regulation. 
when I'm working with any client, I always start with regulation and then move up through these. Um, I know we're short on time and I want us to be able to have some questions. So I'm just going to move through some of these slides really quickly. But um, my the premise in the games is that I want us to move through all of these at the pace that the, that, that the players are, are um, at the pace that the players are comfortable with. Um, again, it's that agency and giving them their agency. Knowing what kind of fun they like to have. There are different kinds of fun. Um, and some people will think, oh, making things easy, um, not for two wee kids, right? Two, two wee kids want that, that hard fun um, and that more engaging fun. Um, and I will share these slides so you can see all of the information in these various slides and the sources are, are given there on all of these slides. Um, there's two other slides I want to share with you, and then I'm going to suggest that we'll transition to uh, sharing questions. On the last few slides, there are some de descriptions of how I use the transactional analysis model to facilitate the relationships in the group. I'm not going to get into that uh, during this conversation, but there's two things I do want to mention. Um, and again, I'm talking about games, but I think this can be applicable to any kind of activity that your kid has that genuine interest and passion in. Um, moving from cooperation to collaboration. Uh, collaboration, uh, cooperation is a good place to start um, because people can have to learn compromise um, in, in, in terms of cooperation. But when they're working, when they're collaborating, when they're moving past uh, cooperation into collaboration, they're actually honoring each other's abilities and building on each other's abilities and coming up with strategies and ways of incorporating everyone. And when a group gets to that place, it is such a beautiful um, thing to see in a group of, with a group of kids. Um, and the other thing, and this is why I, I'm, I'm bringing this in, narrative transference. When we talk about kids who love specific kinds of stories, like anime, um, it's because um, they move from an observer into a participant. Um, one of the things too I also find about roles is recognizing what roles your kid is comfortable with. When they're talking about something that they really love, they're in an expert role. And that's a role that has esteem in it, right? Um, as opposed to, so recognizing what roles kids like to play in, in their, uh, in their uh, daily lives as well. But narrative transference is a powerfully resonant emotional connection with a character, with a story, um, and in a game, uh, we'll, we'll move from being an observer. And often when I'm starting a game, everybody is in an observing place to being a participant and being and, and entering into the trans into the narrative and transferring all of their attention and their emotional energy into the game. Um, and I have seen people um, express deeply existential concerns through the through the lens of, of role play games. Um, uh, engage in deeply emotional where they'll come out and they'll go, I don't know where that came from, uh, where they're expressing tears or they're expressing a longing that they may not even feel like they have in their life, but that they're recognizing that they're, they're drawing from this narrative and it's coming from some authentic part of themselves. Um, so um, role taking and role playing can be a really valuable way of engaging kids uh, to engage with one another. And I'm going to end there so that we can um, answer questions. Thank you so much, Doug and Hadley and Tony. That was amazing. I feel like even though I have a 16 year old, I am still picking up so many great tips from everything you guys said. And um, thank you so much. We were gonna kick off with some of the questions from the chat. And the first one that happened way back at 730, but I think is still a really great question is, what if you have a child who theoretically and actually is interested in social skills, but the anxiety is so overwhelming to them in the, in the moment they don't participate? And that's either just in regular social interactions or within a social skills group. And any of you can answer that. I think all three of you would probably have <laughs> some good things to say about how do we how do we help kids through those situations when they really want to work on their social skills? They want to be social, they want to have friends, but their anxiety just becomes too much for them to, to manage. Yeah, I can I can start, or, or Tony, you go ahead if you'd like. 
Okay. Um, I was going to say in terms of, I think, of course, just meeting where our, our teens, where we are and in, in trying to create emotion regulation strategies of like, how do you manage your anxiety? Like, how do you kind of like say like, you know, I may need a break or I need to kind of take a break right now and, and creating this, um, like I mentioned with peers, this like errorless learning of a, like a really safe space. So finding a group that is going to be accepting, which is pretty much like the number one thing that we say in peers, like no matter what happens, find a group that you can find that's accepting. And that's kind of maybe other like 2E kiddos or um, people who have similar interests as you, and then create small, just brief encounters for them to practice and, and practicing at home and really creating these like real situations for um, just like kind of modeling for them. So like, for instance, like one thing that um, I know is really hard for a lot of our teens is like how to join a conversation where people are already talking, which I think even a lot of us, right, to e or not, that's kind of intimidating. And so practicing that at home, right? So have two people talking, have like a conversation going and then encourage them to pick up on, okay, what did you hear? Like, what are we talking about? Oh, I hear you're talking about anime. Like, how can I jump into this conversation? Right. And then again, I think it, it really starts baseline with just that emotion regulation and, and really supporting and creating different ways for them to stay calm in those moments. And then to also exit those moments if they need to, if they're feeling overwhelmed. But I think the, the long short of it is that it takes time. Yeah. I just want to build a little bit there and, and celebrate the fact that they're in the group because that takes so much, especially if they're anxious. I mean, to be there to show up and manage so much of it. So I think that's where you can celebrate their successes. And then as you're building those regulation skills, working on the emotions, hopefully they can start to talk more. I'm glad you said that, Tony, because that's what I said in the chat. And I said, but let's ask the experts. <laughs> I don't know if Doug wanted to weigh in on that or if I should ask the next question. Nope. Okay. Um, so the next question, and I'm sort of tying a few together, is what do you do when your child tends to blurt out, you know, things that may not be appropriate, kind of doesn't read the room, uh, goes on and on about a topic that they're really passionate about, which causes... Um, social interaction challenges. Who wants to take it first? <laughs> Doug, I see you're unmuted. Or did you want to add to that? Or I wasn't sure. I don't want to cut you off. I don't know how which one of us is going first. This is a good example of social skills. <laughs> We're all trying to figure it out as we sit here reading each other's body language. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And again, I think, yeah, just right. Like having those perspective taking moments of like, what would that be like if, if you were interrupted or like, what, like, what could be risky about interrupting? Like, do you get to know about other people? I mean, I think in terms of just like the executive functioning or like the, I'm gosh, this is my own personal problem. I am constantly interrupting and I get really excited to talk. And so I'm sure that that's like happens with a lot of our kids where you just really want to talk about what you want to talk about. And what if you don't get a chance and you need to say it now? And so I think just, again, like really kind of let's sit with it for a second. Think about, okay, will I ever get to learn about this person if they don't say anything? And Ray, if the goal is to kind of make and keep those friendships, how will I ever get to learn about that? So I would say just kind of creating some of those perspective taking moments of asking questions and you may get responses that are like, well, I don't care. And so I think just also managing those too of, of like really kind of are they fine with this interaction, right? It might be kind of hard as a caregiver or a parent to sit back and watch like, oh, like, oh no, like a social gaffe or or things like that. But really again, following their lead of, um, I don't care what people think about me. If that's how they genuinely feel and respond, then that's how they genuinely feel and they respond. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a tricky one because I think, um... For every kid, there would be a different way of approaching it, and depending on what what's being said and 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 what's happening, um, it, and I too, am, I, again, really centering the kids' agency is important to me. But I, um, if you can see that, um, recognizing the role that they're they're putting themselves in again, because if they're 
they they think they're socially engaging. They right. They think that they're they're they're, they're talking. They're they're. Um, and so if you recognize, but they're not really connecting with the people in the room, um, I would suggest inviting them to go into the other room and then having a conversation with them briefly about what might be happening for the other people. So use it as an opportunity for empathy building. Um, and I would not make it about like that what you're saying is boring or what, or nobody's interested, but to do it as an empathy, you know, when um, you, when you're when your sister or when I'm talking about work and you don't really, you get uncomfortable with, that might be happening in the room right now. Uh, so you, you use it as an opportunity for empathy building. Uh, that would be my go-to just on the basis of that. I agree. And to do it in another room. I agree with um, what you guys have both said. And I think um, this is something I come across in my own life and my own family a lot. And one of the things I do is I, I have to try to remember like coaching and honoring because our kids want a space to talk about it. But sometimes it was Beyblades. That was what we talked about a lot in my home. And, and it would go on as long as I let it. And I started to do some very gentle reflecting and coaching. And hey, you know, we've been talking about this for a while. I'd love to hear about what your day was like at school. And I would just kind of gently suggest it. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. But it it kind of paused, right? And they could stop and think and he could kind of decide where did he want to go with it. And so it's very gentle with my guidance there. All right, I got, got another question for you guys in the chat. Um, so one of our watchers asked, what happens if your child doesn't see the need for friends? And I'm wondering if there's a difference at lower, like an elementary school student who doesn't see the need versus middle school, high school, et cetera. I like to anchor these kind of things into, maybe it's not a play date that you need, but what does that look like when you want to go to the grocery store and you want to choose something and you need to talk to someone or, you know, anchor it to something that maybe that was a really weird example, but something that, that would be meaningful for them as they grow or they develop. So it's not just, hey, I'm doing this because someone wants me to play, but oh, I can practice this so I can go be successful in LARP or I can go and, you know, be part of this math competition and engage in it. Yeah, it's again those attachment needs. I think uh, some kids have different kinds of attachment needs. Um, and uh, I, I would encourage you to question, is this my need to have my kid attached or does my kid need to attach right now? Uh, and so um, I, I understand you want them to be, and I do think that, that navigating the world is, is, is important. Um, and again, I think gameplay can be a way even at home, uh, I think one of the valuable things is uh, if in the game, in the game plays that I'll, I'll, I'll set up scenarios where you don't have a mon enough money for this thing that you really want and you're going into a store, where, uh, right? And, uh, and because we, we play with a pro-social, so, so threatening them is not going to be in, uh, in the cards, right? Um, then having to navigate that, that kind of uh, tricky uh, is a really valuable thing and to do it through play. Um, you can do that at home with the family um, and then and practice, uh, but recognizing your kids' social needs, I think is a really, uh, and knowing their attachment needs um, and recognize, yeah. I'll say it as, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Doug. Uh, I'll say as a therapist sometimes, um, uh, I feel like I'm managing parents' uh, desire for their kids. And then when I'm meeting with their kids, their kids are just delightful. Their kids are engaged. Their kids are being authentic with me. Their kids are totally of making themselves available because I'm entering into play with them and not, not expecting them to, to perform in a specific kind of social way. Um, so kids have those abilities and may not being, be, know how to until they get into relationships with people that can do that. Um, so be aware of is if, if this is your anxiety, holding your anxiety and being able to talk about that anxiety with other parents and other, as opposed to projecting it on your kid. Because um, then your kid then holds that anxiety. 
right? Oh, my mom wants me to do this. And I, I, that would be that. You just said exactly what I was going to say. And it was related to another question that Hadley, I didn't, I, I was going to raise this other question, I think in the context of what you've been talking about too, but that was kind of one of the things I commented on when someone brought that up was what, what I've seen happen a lot, both in my life and watching friends, especially now that we have teenagers is sort of what our expectation is for what their life will be like. What, what does social life look like for a teenager? And then our anxiety getting the better of us when what they are choosing to do isn't what we hoped for or what we thought their social lives would be like. And then they pick up on that and they feel like something is wrong with them. And, and if we just would be less anxious ourselves about how they're choosing to have their social lives, then they wouldn't have that added sort of pressure on top of them that not only maybe, maybe they want to have a better social life, maybe they don't, but to have their parent have that anxiety too is a lot. It's a big burden for, for them to carry. So the more we can work on our own anxiety because it's a very primal fear that maybe your child doesn't belong or isn't part of a tribe or won't be taken care of. You know, I think that's, it's a very primal thing um, in terms of survive, survival of your children. Um, it hits on those primal notes, but it's not great for the kids to, to know that you're so stressed out about, about it. So, um, and this kind of goes along with what uh, Leslie in the chat was saying is like, she said, I've heard a saying in another context that parents should never be working harder or care more than their kids about their grades or school. I'm wondering, what do you do as a parent when the child is reticent to try anymore and the parent feels like they're the one doing all the work, hopefully you're, hopefully respectfully, like looking for opportunities. So she doesn't want to minimize how difficult this is for the child. But, you know, like when you get to that point as a parent where maybe your kids kind of giving up on, on the social aspects. Yeah. I think having that conversation of why, why are they giving up? Is it because it's not interesting and it doesn't seem like it's something that they want personally, or is it because of a, a history of rejection and, and it feels hard and they don't want to be rejected anymore? Or is it an anxiety of, I've seen these things happen on social media and I know I'll never be this. So I can't be this, et cetera. And so I think just having that open discord, like, especially for those of you who have very young kids, like starting that now, but just having that open conversation so that they can not only just kind of expand their own personal emotional vocabulary of being able to express themselves and understand that, but then to, to help you understand of like, where is this stemming from? Because really then the kind of answer is going to be different, right? The outcome is going to be different. If it's that they're tired of rejection, well, that's going to look a lot different than they're just quite anxious or, um, or they don't want it right. Looking like being rejected versus I don't want it at all. And I'm not interested is very different. I mean, I, I can think of a, an example of, we had this teen whose mom really wanted him to try peers and he said, yeah, I'll try it. Um, but if I don't like it, I want to stop. And within three sessions, he was like, I don't want friends. I want to play my video games alone. And I, that's all I want to do. I'm fair. I want to eat my dinner at six o'clock and this group's at six 30. So I don't want to do it anymore. And they dropped and we supported that because it wasn't what he wanted. And it was, it was honest. And so I think, again, just having those conversations and, and also just finding somebody who can help support you and your own anxiety of not knowing what it's going to be like when they're older or needing support or, or wanting to be in a relationship and things like that. Um, which I will say, I didn't talk about this at all, but we do have like dating specific skills for, um, individuals who have social difficulties. Um, and we're, we're create, we have a, a research project right now where we're looking at, um, like coaching with that, but, um, in terms of like a clinical group, we're hoping to have that in the future as well. So, sexual education is really important and, and dating and things like that. And so I, I, I can understand why anxiety would come up now of just like how to get them to play or interact with others. And um, I think just having those conversations is important. When it comes to conversations, it can be hard because sometimes our kids shut us down and they're not going to talk to a parent about what we want to talk to them about. And so I think finding someone, it doesn't even have to be a professional, right? Like it can be, and that can be someone in their corner, but maybe it's a grandparent or it's a family friend that you trust and you can give them total freedom 
to have time with that person. It, it's hard as a parent because we want them to come to us, but sometimes someone outside of it can make a big difference. Abby, I think, did you say that you saw some questions that you were gonna sure. ask? Um, yes. Okay, I have one here that says, I'd love to know whether my child's challenge in accepting responsibility for hurtful actions is something that's common with 2E kids. And if so, or could you just speak a little bit more about that, that idea of accepting responsibility? And I see another related one. Plus one for hurting people with words as a defense and then digging into the position as defense times 10. <laughs> that was me. And I wonder if I can say a tiny bit more about it. Hi, I'm so glad to be here. Um, is that okay? Awesome. <laughs> so my, what I notice about my child, she's 10, and is that if she makes a mistake or if somebody even speaks to her in a tone that is not even necessarily harsh, but is firm or even just serious, she takes it really, really deep to heart. Or, you know, she makes a mistake and she's, um, you know, there's a, there's a consequence or somebody has a, has a response to that, you know, if she's hurtful sometimes and, you know, a friend. Hey, Casey, is your daughter, what is your daughter? Um, autism, ADHD, dyslexia, what's... So she's only ever been diagnosed with sensory processing difference when she was really young. Um, she's in a school for gifted learners. You know, she's got like a photographic memory. Um, I, you know, I'm just sort of new to this 2E category and I'm trying to understand because my child's having some social issues at school. She has issues with her teachers. You know, she gets really upset sometimes when, you know, when they set limits with her. And, and it's as if she had this like deep, deep shame that she's trying to manage or, and I just, you know, I don't think it's a parenting thing, I, I, you know? So, so we have a couple of people, uh, someone says my 17 year old is waving his hand as in me too, for being very sensitive to tones or harsh limits. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just put in the chat something about rejection, sensitivity, a dysphoria, but I don't, I, I am not an expert. I just play one on the internet. So what say our panelists? Yes, I work with rejection sensitivity dysphoria a lot. Um, and, I, and I think it's it's pretty common among um, neurodivergent folks, uh, particularly if, uh, kids with ADHD, we'll see it a lot. Um, um, and I also saw the comment about bullying, uh, which I, I think is, but, uh, but going, uh, I want to say about the bullying, it can be really reparative to have kids just being accepting. And so then again, finding a group where your, your kid is, it can have a reparative experience and recognize and not cast that wide net of bullying can be really valuable. Um, but in rejection, working with rejection sensitivity dysphoria, um, uh, honoring what the person's experience is and then really helping them to, uh, again, in, in an empathy building way, uh, what could be other reasons that this, this person may have said this? Now, recognizing that if they're dealing with a bully or dealing with somebody that that could be a real, right? You, we don't want to dis, discount their feelings. But if, if, uh, if they're, when they're telling the, the story, uh, clearly the, 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 the experience could be interpreted in a number of different ways, helping them to, um, um, because I think of rejection sensitivity dysphoria as being a fixed mindset and then moving more towards a growth mindset just in terms of how they're hearing other people when they're expressing discomfort um, or uh, other experiences that then may feel like it's a rejection. I, I love it. Tony, anyone want to have the, you guys want to have your last words? Cause we're, we're at eight 30. Yeah. So. I, I think we were both kind of waiting for each other. Do you want to go next or would you like me to? No, oh, yeah, I know. I, I, Zoom makes it like Zoom social skills are so hard. It's like so hard. No, I'm all you, Tony, go ahead. Um, you know, I was thinking about this as arming the child with information and helping them with perspective taking. And so validating, as Doug said, validate what they're feeling, validate what they go through, and then be curious about what the other person is going through. And sometimes like when I was at a school, I 
to know different people or know the different situation. I think, you know, have you noticed that maybe that's the sound of their voice all the time, right? Like, or there might be something they were picking up that really wasn't that different, but they were so sensitive to it. They could, could get just something a little bit there. Or we could sit, you know, talk about, well, what if, you know, they had a really bad night's sleep last night. And so they're a little more sensitive in their tone of voice. And we would kind of brainstorm what could be all these other things. And in that could also be like, what if they really were frustrated with you? And what does that mean? And just try to get them thinking about it and being curious about not only themselves, but the other person as well. Um, kind of normalize that everybody is going through things and everybody feels things. Yeah, totally agree. I mean, I think just that perspective taking is really important. And I, I think just building that over time in a, in a compassionate way where people can feel like, they're not kind of being pointed out of, of like, these are your deficits. Like, how did you not see this? Or like, can you not see this? But really just kind of asking. I think I, I can think of many times where I've been working with kids and I just say how I feel like that really hurt my feelings. And I think just like being very honest of like, I kind of hurt my feelings and, and having that conversation um, just compassionately. Thank you, everyone. Since we are at 8.30, um, and I know there's more questions in the chat, um, you can always email um, uh, Abby or, or me or um, Callie at real2e.org, and then we can get in touch with our experts to get you any answers that we missed. Um, and this recording will be made available um, so you can watch it again uh, and send it to friends. Um, and we thank you all so much for coming. And thank you so much to our experts. I learned so much. I'm sure you all did too. Um, and it was a very encouraging conversation. I feel like I have things that I can go try now. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.